Okay, well, good evening, everybody. I want to welcome everybody. I'm Doug Stone. I am the co-founder or uh, founder of uh, ForWhiskeyLovers.com. We have here as my co-hosts for the evening, um, Rhonda Kalman, who is the founder uh, and uh, owner of Boston Harbor Distillery. Um, we've got um, uh, we've got uh, John Stark, who is the master blender and uh, and lead distiller at Boston Harbor Distillery. And we've got Alan Saxton, who works with me, heading up our customer service. If any of you have ever sent me an email in for one of your orders or anything, odds are, if I didn't answer it, Alan answered it. So, uh, so you know, we're going to start, I guess, let's start before we get to our first whiskey. I'd love Rhonda to introduce herself, talk a little bit about her background. John introduce himself, talk a little bit about his background and, you know, how we got to where we are today, where they are today. Well, awesome. We're here because of you, Doug. So thank you very much. And Alan as well. Um, actually, we're, we're joined from people all over Maryland, Texas, New Hampshire, Indiana, Massachusetts, California, and Florida, and New York. So, cheers to everybody. Yeah. My name is Rhonda Kelman. As Doug said, I am the founder and the CEO here at Boston Harbor Distillery. Uh, where we make really good stuff here in the Boston area. My background is actually in craft beer. Um, that's where I started my career in the uh, craft drinks business, but I always loved whiskey. Um, and so the good news is, as you know, whiskey starts off as the same process as beer merely. So I've come full circle. And uh, I saw a white space for whiskey making here in the Boston area. Uh, much like we did Jim Cook from Sam Adams. I'm the co-founder of that. I, I helped him put that on the map. Uh, it was a lot of fun, spent 15 years doing that. But at the end of the day, uh, like I said, I, I've always loved whiskey and I'm really proud and excited uh, to be here. I started this in 2012, opened the doors in 2015 and whiskey takes time. It takes a lot of time for a lot of reasons. Um, you can see behind me is where we're located. That's the building. I'm actually sitting in my office at the distillery, but it's kind of fun on Zoom. And uh, we're at the southernmost waterfront of Boston Harbor. Um, and this pre-Civil War era, 1850s building that was started by none other than this guy, Silas Putnam who automated the horseshoe nail manufacturer. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for this man, my master, my master blender and my head distiller, John Stark. Uh, and without further ado, I will introduce you. Or you can introduce yes, you. <laughs> I will introduce myself, yes, thank you. Um, I'm John, I am the, the head distiller here at um, Boston Harbor Distillery. Um, I've been here for, I think going on three years-ish now. Um, working with Rhonda, and it's been a really good time. Um, prior, I was actually in in finance, but that was um, that was a snore, as you would imagine. So I'd always had a keen interest in in beverage alcohol, um, both you know socially. I like to share um, you know drinks, strands with my friends, and everything. And little did I know you could actually make a, a career out of it. So I contacted Rhonda. Um, and after I'd retired from finance, I like to say, um, I decided that um, beverage alcohol making, you know, really good whiskey was what I wanted to do. And that's exactly what Rhonda was, was doing already. So I hopped on a board about three years ago and I haven't really looked back since. And here we are. How did you learn how to distill, John? Um, I had a very good teacher. The, the man, um, John Cushow, actually, who helped Rhonda um, open Boston Harbor Distillery, actually came back for a, a brief while and helped me with um, getting started and everything. And since then, you know, there's a lot of really good resources. I'm glad I actually started doing this in this day and age when, you know, everything's about a click away. So any, every, <laughs> you can really learn a lot in, in a small amount of time with a bunch of YouTube and... right. Actually, my, my first hire here was, um, was a, 
one of the greats uh, that we lost too early, but his name was Dr. James Swan. And he was considered the world's expert on whiskey maturation, Scottish guy uh, that worked for Arthur Anderson when he was a young man and in Scotland. And so, you know, it was an accounting firm and they had him crawl around in all the distilleries all over Scotland and trying to figure out how to account for the liquid gold that was in those barrels. So he had to learn everything about it. So I hired him first and then um, I, I needed somebody here to distill, of course, and that was John Cushow. And uh, he's still, you know, part of, part of us here and, and we consult with him when we need him. But this guy, John Stark, uh, has done a really remarkable job. And, you know, there's a lot of conversions. There's a lot of math in this business. And so he's, he's a good, he's a keeper for sure. But so when you were, you know, getting things together and you're getting ready to go, why whiskey? I mean, certainly whiskey has been a very hot category for years, but it, you know, it's expensive as I don't have to, you know, it's, it's expensive as hell to make. You got to sit on, you, you know, you got, you can't sell anything for a couple of years. And so why do a whiskey as opposed to a vodka or gin or a, uh, a fruit, you know, a fruit spirit. And then tonight we're really focusing on rye. So why rye? Well, all good questions is like, I mean, whiskey was my first love ever since I was a young girl. My father would drink rye and ginger and fall asleep on the chair on a Saturday. So I drank it while he was sleeping. It was perfect. I just loved it. And when Jim Cook asked me to help him start a, a beer company, I said, Jim, I don't drink beer. I drink whiskey. And he promised that he'd make something that I'd like. Of course he did. Um, but for me, I, why not? I mean, there was a white space for whiskey making here in Boston. And I'm born and raised here. I've lived within 20 miles of where we're, you know, where the distillery is my whole life, which is pretty long, as you can probably tell. But um, it's a great life. And I just saw that why not make whiskey in Boston? And so my my background in craft beer, uh, I spent 15 years at, you know, building Boston Beer Company. So it was a pretty remarkable time. Um, but really what I took away from what I loved most about that whole experience was craft, like going out there and spreading the word for better drinking. And, you know, craft is really an ingredient story um, with real, authentic, passionate people behind it. And it's, of course, it's been corrupted in so many ways by the big guys. But to me, that's really the, the core of what craft is. And so, you know, look, there's, 10, 15 million barrels of whiskey laid down in just Kentucky and Tennessee alone of bourbon whiskey. And by law, of course, has to be made with the majority of corn. And being at craft in the craft beer business for so long, it's really an anti-corn story. Um, you know, Bud Miller, Coors, Heineken, Corona, they're all corn-based corn beers, so they're lighter and they're sweeter and, you know, they're a little bit cheaper to make. And I really got into the whole grains. Uh, you know, craft beer is 100% malted barley and now there's wheats and all kinds of different, really rich, powerful, flavorful things. And so whiskey was it, whole grain whiskey was it. And if you started with vodka, which we, we only make vodka to put into a, a, a pre-made, uh, beautiful craft cocktail in a bottle, 750 bottle of it. That's the only reason why we have vodka in house. I always say it's like an alcohol delivery system. <laughs> like it's just so easy to drink. Uh, why not get there in a flavorful way? But then you, you know, you, you kind of corrupt what you stand for. So we started with whiskey and it wasn't easy. And part of the reason why we started with rye is because it requires the least amount of aging and still tastes good. Um, and so, you know, that rye is important. And it's also America's whiskey. Uh, it was the first whiskey that George Washington made in the 1700s, 50 years before bourbon. Yeah. And to me, that's what I love most about bourbon. It's uniquely American, yeah. like champagne is to France and tequila is to Mexico. But so I wanted to have some of that heritage. Um, and of course, uh, I called it Putnam because he's the guy who built this 
whole 18 acre parcel and made horseshoe nails. So the, you know, our label is the horse and rider, which is uh, his uncle. And uh, it just kind of fit with America's first whiskey. And there's a lot of firsts here in Boston. <laughs> so yeah. I find them and I bring them to light. That's great. Well, yeah. speaking of first, why don't we do our first one? Well, we're going to start with your standard ride, right? We're going to start with that. Um, uh, just because I talk a lot, um, I'm going <laughs> to show that that uh, the distiller, he's going to kind of go into what we're making here and what we're tasting, and then I'll jump in. Yeah, so this is our white label Putnam Rye, the flagship um, rye expression at Boston Harbor. It is bottled at 86 proof, um, majority aged for about four years, and is in the grand scheme of things, particularly small batch blends of you know five to ten barrels, or anywhere in between there, going into each expression. Um, how it kind of tries to differentiate itself from other rye brands or kind of more traditional rye flavors is we really like to. Um, subtly express the, the rye spice and the pepper notes and put a little bit more emphasis on a slightly sweeter palate so that we really think of it kind of as a, you know, really soft type of rye whiskey. It's really, you're not going to get that violent egg rye spice out of the Putnam brand, but you will get a very flavor, flavorful and very unique um, expression. So I hope you enjoy. I'm at least. Bottoms up. <laughs> mm. You know, just actually, we sort of spun this as a national, as the anniversary of Bottled and Bond. You want to talk a little bit about Bottled and Bond and what that means? Johnny? If anyone. Yeah. Anyone. Yeah, I've got, uh, so um, I, everybody, if you need, if you want to speak, just come off of mute so you can ask questions and, or respond. Bottled so, and bond is the going question. Anybody? John, you want to talk about bottled and bond a little bit, what that means? Yeah, sure. So that was one of the first designations that the um, U.S. government put in to regulate um, whiskey in the United States prior to the Bottle and Bond Act, you know, you could get away with a lot of rectification, which, you know, a lot of people were taking, um, you know, basically neutral grain stuff, coloring it, putting it in a bottle and calling it, you know, X amount of aged whiskey. Um, and you could get away with that, but the Bottle and Bond designation put in place some parameters that, you know, gave the consumer um, the ability to confidently by real true whiskey and those de designations are and i'm going off the top of my head on this one um it has to be distilled at one distillery um in one distilling season um at least four years of age bottled at 100 proof and i think that's it yeah i think so too yeah but a minimum of 100 proof yeah oh uh, yeah 100 proof and also, doesn't it, isn't there something about storing it or aging it in a bonded warehouse? Is that part of it too? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. That's, I guess, in this day and age, really kind of relatively normal. But yes. Yeah. Right. It's right. To be bonded by the U.S. government. Right. Which is like a seal of approval. Great. Good. Correct. Cool. 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 So. What is, tell us a little bit about John, I guess you're still, I take it that's you're still behind you. Can you tell us a little bit about it and what the output is every year? Yeah, sure. So that's a, that's a, uh, a Vendome still, it's a, it's a hybrid still model. So you can actually see right there, the little column on top um, and the pot on the bottom. So there are some valves on the back that you can't see. So you're able to either activate or circumvent that column while distilling. So you can use it as a column still or a pot still. Um, it has a capacity of about 200 gallons, um, closer to 180. But, um, and we run everything that we uh, 
but we distilled through that. That's our that's our current only still. Um, however, we do have a slightly larger 500 gallon one that we recently put a deposit down on that I'm really really excited about. So you'll be able to enjoy even more Putnam whiskey. Mm -hmm. So so Doug, there's a fun story about this still because I mentioned Dr. Swan, Scottish guy, of course. He wanted me to buy Scottish stills from his friend, Richard Forsyth, those beautiful, you know, big onion, all copper. Um, and Forth Forsyth stills have been in business for hundreds of years. And they're beautiful, like they're beautiful. And I was going to, you know, look into it. And I met, I met Richard Forsyth and got their, you know, their quote, and it was really expensive as an entrepreneur going into the whiskey business, you know, trying to pull all this together. I just really could not pull the trigger on it. But then I started thinking about, well, why would I want to buy stills from Scotland when I want to make American whiskey? And I want to do it right here in Boston. Right. So I went to Vendome. This is the Econo model still, but I figured it would get me started. Uh, frankly, at the time, I didn't have a branding idea. I just thought we were going to make like one off barrels for the restaurant industry or retailers or aficionados or enthusiasts, custom spirits. It's still in my logo today, but it turned out I got the still um, and it happened. So for each piece of equipment that's used to make uh, alcohol, the government requires a registered serial number from the, the maker of, of the equipment. And this happens to be the 1,776 piece of equipment, 1776 ended there up right go. here. That Vendome, uh, you know, America's oldest copper manufacturer in Louisville um, actually manufactured in 1776 ended up here. So I thought this is very a very cool. good sign and yeah. it's pretty exciting. So. The 500 gallon, we luckily, uh, I knew that this was the, this one, the small puppy was just the start. Um, so we, we've done all the plumbing. We have a big furnace that a boiler that will support the 500 gallon still. So we're about, well, I'll call it nine months away. It's like, we're gonna have a big 500 pound baby coming up in the next- You just did a whole months. fundraising campaign for that, right? Yes, that which I great. think you participated yeah. in. Thank you all who had. Yeah. So, so Doug, I would like to get some feedback from, you know, from our participants. What are they like? What are they getting on the nose? What's on the palate at the beginning? What do they think about this? I'm really curious to see what, what, what you guys think about this and you can unmute and, you know, just anybody chime in. I would like to get your, get your thoughts on this. Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, and this is Ken. Um, I, I, on my, on the nose, I got, um, cherry cough drops and cherry cordial, which I thought was a little unusual. Um, unusual for, a, for a rye or just on. Yes. I, well, okay. yeah, I, I thought it was okay. a little bit unusual for a rye, not, not okay. so unusual for, for other whiskeys, but for a rye, for me, at least for ryes that I've tried, it was a, it was a little unusual for me. Um, and not, not unusual in a bad way. I, I, I think it's, it has a good nose. Um, I, for the palate, I got, a, I got a, a little bit of a medicinal, maybe, maybe a little bit of a cough drop uh, flavor um, and some bread spice. And I thought the, I thought the, uh, the finish was, uh, was good as a, you know, like a medium finish for me. Okay. That's great. That's just on. Yeah, on good feedback. Thanks for that, Ken. And, you know, I, so far, so cherry. I hadn't taken it because I was so thirsty. I didn't even bother <laughs> with the nose, but <laughs> there is heavy cherry in this in the nose. You're absolutely. I mean, that's what I. Everybody smells their own and tastes it. Every it's everybody's independent. You know, it's totally subjective. But I totally get the cherry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I get some pepper. I mean, obviously, uh, barrels play an important role. In, in all of it. And we're using uh, barrels from different small coopers from all over the United States, uh, which makes it pretty exciting. As John mentioned, you know, we, we, uh, we blend, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's 10 barrels together. They're not always from the same cooperage. Yeah. 
um, and you know we we do require that the the barrels that we get have a heavy toast. I'm sorry, that are seasoned first for 18 months, and then toasted, and then a heavy char. So we're doing a number four alligator char uh, right now, uh, but we have some plans to just play around with some different barrels. And well, you'll see the barrel finish, I guess, is next. So I don't know if uh, if I'm leading it correctly, Doug, but maybe we want to go into that the next uh, the, yeah. the Cab Franc yep. wine barrel finish at this point. So what, what we're after with our whiskey um, is this silky yeah. smoothness, which is unusual for a rye. Um, it's not that big punch that you get with rye often. And it, it I call it a little bit of a beginner's whiskey because it's so easy to drink. We have people walk into the distillery all the time. And they're like, I don't like whiskey. We're like, we haven't tasted ours yet. And they actually leave loving it and because they don't understand it. And then, so that's, that's a big part of what we do here is we're open for tours and tastings to the public so that they can learn and they can get educated um, on how all this stuff works. So it's really pretty exciting. Our, our landlord and our neighbor happens to be uh, the Boston Winery. So between the uh, Quabbin Reservoir water that we get from the Berkshire Mountains, which is one of America's, uh, well, I think it was voted the best water supply in the country. And I'm not sure how that works from, you know, we're one of the oldest places and we've got great water, but the Quabbin Reservoir is a pretty special place. And so there's a, there's a certain uh, terroir to that. Uh, so between that and that we're in Boston, we're, we're actually using barrels from the Boston winery. All of our stuff has a uniquely Boston accent. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out there. So John, tell us about this. What do you do with this? Yeah, so the, the red wine finish is a little bit more limited um, than the whiskey that you just tried previously. Um, I only make it a, a handful of barrels at a time. So it is a little bit out of convenience for the winery when they have their Cab Franc barrels available. That's when I get to start finishing our red wine finished rye. Um, it's, it rests in the barrels for, I always like to say until ready, um, which is coincidentally, you know, around six months, um, depending on the season. And it's a little bit more unique than the um, white label rye because I actually go through and I'll hand select specific barrels that I want to go into these barrels. So it really is one barrel just moving into another. And it's a barrel that I think could really benefit from resting for additional time in a freshly dumped Cab Franc wine barrel. That's, you know, what I love about that and what I think is so great about what you guys do and other small, small, smaller distilleries is that you do stuff like this, which means that if not every bottle, certainly every batch is going to be slightly different, which is great because that, that makes me want to come back for more. When you're tasting, and this isn't meant to bash any of the bigger distilleries, but you know, they, they, uh, they strive for consistency from bottle to bottle, year to year, which is wonderful but it sort of takes away a little bit of the adventure or a little bit of, to me, the excitement about, you know, tasting whiskey from distilleries and drinking it. And there'll be years when you, I like it more and there may be years when I like it a little bit less, but it, it always, it always makes it more compelling to me to be tasting a whiskey that's made from barrels that may vary from, from year to year. Right. I agree. Um, this particular one on the red wine barrel finish, you could taste the, the wine adds this, this layered sweetness to it. Um, gives it a little bit of depth and color. Um, it's just easy drinking, really nice. 
And that too is bottled at 86. So it's what John's yes. doing, uh, you know, it's 95 five rye to malted barley. And then it's the 86 proof and then um, put it back in the barrel. And that 95 rye, five barley, that's the same mash bill as your, as the first one we tasted, correct? Yeah. 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 This is delicious. This is really delicious. When you're aging these, um, does the barrels rotate throughout your warehouse, like at different levels, or do you specifically hold at like the top level for humidity and that, or is it in your warehouse? Do, you, do that? Yeah. Change? I know it changes the flavor based on you know the humidity where it's at, heat and that. So, are these? Do you keep these up at like a specific position in the? Bear, you know, in your rack as it's aging, or is it being rotated throughout? Like everything, you know, you start at the top, you come down, you go back up. Or I'm not sure what your process is, but you know, we kind of hit all levels in your warehouse. Yeah. So the um, regular rye, for sure, there. It's not. I wouldn't say it's an exact science. I mean, they just get moved around kind of when they need to move. Sometimes they're in the way and you have to move them around. Um, I, I, do have a, I do have a favorite spot for especially new make barrels that I've found. And it's the wall that abuts the boiler. That area gets especially hot. So you, you really get some very, not you know, quick aging going on, but the maturation process does kind of um, speed up a little bit and it creates a very, very kind of caramel candy like whiskey. So that's probably my favorite section of the warehouse, but only so many barrels can fit there. Unfortunately, that'd be where I'd get my honey barrels from, which you'll probably, you'll probably try next, I think is, <laughs> is next in the lineup. Right on. Yeah, the cast strength single barrel. That, that's distiller's picks. I love it when I come in in the morning and, you know, he's got a tray of all these things that he's tasting. And it's like, woo, breakfast. <laughs> Brad has a question. Brad, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, it's really just a, uh, a comment. One thing is the color. The color is, is outstanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's just a, comparing it to, to other other bourbons and other whiskeys, just an outstanding, unique color. Just really enjoy it. And a wonderful flavor. I met, I wanted to ask you all, and I, I, um, I don't know the experience with everyone here with, with whiskey and all this, but I'm a little on the newer side, but I do know that different climates affect the way that the, that the whiskey matures in the barrel and how it, how it comes out. What, um, being in Boston, how does that affect it differently than say like a Tennessee or Kentucky? I mean, is it is it aged differently? Like Texas is a little different. Like for you guys, how's it different? Yeah, I think I'll take some of this anyway. Um, so this historic building that we're in, of course, it was the Putnam Nail Factory, as I mentioned, and then it was the Lolly Shipyard, and they built they're famous for America's Cup winning yachts. And in this building, they built minesweepers for World War II as well. And then when the war ended, they went out of business. And then the last notable entrepreneur to have commerce here was, is, was the Seymour's Ice Cream Factory. And so uh, you could see it off uh, on my picture there. The flat roof is actually the freezer that held the ice cream. And when I, when I met I, I go back to Swan all the time because that's kind of where it all started. Um, it was just luck in a lot of ways. Uh, I went out and met him in Taiwan because he's responsible for a brand, <clears throat> excuse me, called Kavalan, which is made in Taiwan. And so, you know, I, I started the business in 2012. I didn't open the doors until 2015. So I, you know, I got to do some things, but um, I went out to Taiwan to see what they were doing out there. And at the time, Kavalan was the most awarded whiskey in the world. Um, I don't know if it still is, but when you've got billions, you could buy competition, you know, you can send your stuff to all the competitions. It was very good. But what I learned while I was out there, Brad, was 
that it was so hot. The climate is so hot out there that here's the most awarded whiskey in the world that had to get out of the barrel within two years. Because if they didn't, they would either lose it to the angel share with evaporation or it would turn to oak juice that, that the heat imparted so much of the wood um, at, not to mention, you know, they would lose a lot of money because of the evaporation. So they, they were selling two-year-old whiskey. It was pretty amazing. My 90-year-old mother always said age is just a number. <laughs> <laughs> and she wasn't wrong. Um, and so, you know, the, the years, if you, if you compare that to like Scotland, they don't have temperature control. So our freezer building is insulated. I should probably finish my thought. Our freezer building is insulated because it was an ice cream factory. Not to mention Whitey Bulger used to disappear people there, but that is another story for the end. <laughs> I thought um, that was all in, uh, I thought all that happened in Southie. Well, we're, this is, Do this is Dorchester. It's just right down the road. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, but they used this because it's insulated. So they said that, you know, you couldn't hear the screams. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where our last one, Demon Seed, comes in. But we'll get uh. <laughs> um, So we, when, when I found this building, it was, there were, were never utilities in it. It's from the 1850s. So we had to put everything in. So we did. We put a temperature zone in the freezer. So John, John plays with that a bit. Um, if it, you know, it's been cold, like six, seven months, eight months of the year, it feels like it's cold here. So when it gets too cold, you know, we might turn it up and then ride it down because of course the wood is porous and you want that whiskey inside the barrel to live inside that wood and grab those wood sugars and, right. and flavors and, you know, caramels. And then when it's cold, it kind of shuts it down and the whiskey and the water and the wood make very good friends together. So it really, we, there is no science for us at this time. I mean, we are small and, and very crafty. So it's more of an art than a science. So we have a little bit of a, a leg up here in Boston, but we are actually, as you can see, we're on the water um, and there's a big development going in next door. I was just meeting with them today and I'm hoping they're going to build us a little rick house out there. Or we'll just open up the, the slats and let the sea air come through. It's going to be cool. Well, thanks for answering that. It is, this is, it's really lovely this. I really enjoy this, this crab frog situation going on. Cheers. Really cool. Well, there'll be more. I mean, that I think is a, is the future for us, uh, at least in the rye, you know, the rye, um, expressions we'll we'll extend those with some fun different finishes and that's a it's a great way to yeah to bring people on to something different and I'll, I'll point out one quick thing too we're i'm from maryland and if you know the you know history rye whiskey in maryland maryland pennsylvania this whole area was a huge thing and you know before prohibition it was a huge huge market in maryland and i think one of the last ones to come out was was Pikesville or uh, something from uh, Monument uh, Distilling or something, which was the last of the Maryland uh, rye distillers. But that was a big thing here. So it's really cool to be sitting here with you all doing this with a nice rye. So really nice job. Well, thank you. Great. John went to school in Maryland. Did. <laughs> Cheers to Maryland. Any uh, one else have any questions or comments or anything before we move on? All righty. Should we go to the cast strength? Oh, yeah. One sec. Did uh, we write in the proof on that? What do you guys have for proof? Because each barrel is different. 131. Right. Yeah, 131. 131. Oh, John's drinking 125 here. Yeah. Oh, that's sorry. Well, you guys got a good one. Yeah, I, I mean, as you know, well, maybe you don't, but so whiskey by law has to go into the barrel at 125 proof. 
comes off the still by law at 160 proof. So we smith it down with basically demineralized water and we put the whiskey in the barrel at 125 or below. We actually go in a little lower and as if on cue, John, maybe you can tell him, I was telling him that by law you have to go in at 125 proof and we go in a little lower. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, of course. So the um, generally, you know, rise, a lot of the, the big producers will put in, um, as Rhonda mentioned, 125 proof is the maximum. And from a financial standpoint, that's the best proof to put in because you get to store, you know, more alcohol with less barrels. So you're spending a lot less on barrels and storage. Um, and that's good for, you know, big, the big producers, but here, you know, we're not competing with, with them so much. So we actually have the ability to play around with that, that, that entry level and the lower the proof. So you're basically playing with molecules in the oak that either are alcohol soluble or water soluble, more or less so. Um, and on the lower proof end, you have more wood sugars that are soluble. So that's where you're getting the, your sweeter flavors from the wood. Um, so we do go in at a slightly lower proof than, than 125 in order to extract a little bit more of the wood sugars. As I was saying before, we're going after a little bit of a, a sweeter version of a rye whiskey. And that's one of the ways to, to get that. So as Rhonda mentioned, or someone mentioned, you're drinking 131 proof single barrel. Um, that's one of my favorites. I'm drinking the 125. It's probably my second favorite. You got <laughs> favorite one. I don't have a bottle of it sitting around right now. <laughs> Here's to you guys. But so what's so interesting is, you know, so we go in lower, but you just, you know, never know if the proof is going to go up or the proof is going to come down. Oh, this might have been next to the wall, uh, you know, of the boiler. Oh, right. Well, we can talk about that, too. I didn't realize that's, that was the subject matter. Um, it is now. It is now. <laughs> so depending, depending on the environment that, you're, that, it's, that the barrel of whiskey is being aged in, you're either going to um, find more evaporation happening in um, of alcohol or more evaporation happening in water. So the kind of drier the environment, the more water um, evaporation you're going to have. And so if it's a highly humid environment, you're actually going to get more alcohol evaporation. Um, so you'll see, if, for example, in Scotland, you'll see a lot of whiskeys come out of the barrel at a lower proof than they entered in. Um, and traditionally in the United States, especially, you know, kind of urban country and everything, Texas, especially as well, um, you get a, an increase in proof. So you're getting more water evaporation. So this whiskey probably, you know, jumped, you know, probably close to 11, 12, 13 proof points over its, in the barrel. So I think and now that we're drinking something that's got such a high proof. I'm happy to talk about it, um, Rhonda or John, if you want to talk about it. But I always find when we're talking, when we're drinking something this high proof, that especially for folks who may be a little newer to the world of whiskey, talking about the advantages and reasons of adding a little bit of water or a cube, not a snow, co snow cone, but a cube or two to whiskey. Do you want to talk about that or? I can I can talk about a lesson I got in an airplane from a woman from a woman who was a chemical engineer once. I mean, well, I, I want to hear that story. So, <laughs> well, all right. Well, so I, I was you know, I was new to the I the, I had just started my website and I grew up with a father who was a whiskey drinker and only drank everything neat and putting anything on the rocks or certainly never with water and even drinking it on the rocks was heresy. And shortly after I started this business and I was going to events and all the, my, my, my site initially had a focus on scotch. And so all the events I was going to, all the guys who would kilts would always put a cube in their, in their whiskey 
or take a straw, add a few drops of water to the whiskey. So I was coming home from an event in California once, and I sat down next to a woman on the airplane who ended up being a, a chemical engineer. And I asked her about this. I said, you know, why should people be adding, what, what's the story with adding water to whiskey and why would we do it? And she said, oh, it's easy. She said, water molecules, I'm sorry, alcohol, when you create a high proof whiskey, and this is, she explained to me as, because I'm an idiot, but when you create a high proof whiskey, the flavor <laughs> molecules bond with the alcohol molecules but they don't bond well. It's, it's not a friendly bond. And hence at a very high proof whiskey, that's why you'll start, uh, you'll start to get a little bit of a bite. And when you add a couple of drops of water to a whiskey or a cube to whiskey, the alcohol molecules will release the flavor molecules to bond with the water molecules, which is what causes a whiskey to open up. When they say the, it causes it to get a little bit softer in your mouth because you're tasting the, 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 the alcohol molecules are now bonded with the water molecules. And that opening up of the flavor, as people says, or the flavor sort of opens, is caused by those flavor molecules being released and becoming, I guess, more accessible. That's how she explained it to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it opens it up. Water transforms it. Um, we, we, I do it for high proof stuff. If you ever see like the old magazines, the whiskey magazines, the old curmudgeon Scottish guy, I always had like a little water pitcher next to yeah. him. So they, they would just obviously drink it out of the cask and proof it down on their own. Right. And yeah. There's no, you know, used to be, I guess, um, you were a sissy if you did that. <laughs> These days when you're drinking whiskey and, you know, I just, I went to, I went somewhere recently and I ordered uh, some whiskey on the rocks just because we were tasting out of the barrel room <laughs> for much of the day. I just wanted a cold drink. Yeah. And I got this whole earful from the bartender about how I'm not supposed to drink whiskey that way. I had a friend with me and said, I wouldn't go there. You don't know who you're dealing with. Right, but exactly. Sometimes you just, you know, and that's the beauty of it coming from the beer business. This is nirvana. I mean, whiskey, because it's so, you, you can do so much with it. You can drink it neat. You can have it with a little water. You can drink it on the rocks. You can have a great cocktail. And what I love most about it is, you know, with beer, once it once it goes into the package or the uh, you know leaves the lot, I always say it's like a new car. It starts to go downhill because it's packaged fresh. Well, what the distillation process does is kind of stop it, you know, stop the degradation. And so you can do so much with this, um, and it really is transformative the way you want to make it, which probably leads to the next whiskey, just for the sake of people's time yep. I maybe the old fashions at the end sure. even though it's it's along the Putnam range but I, I mentioned the word you know transformative demon seed hang on to your hats everybody this stuff is hot as hell and doesn't it's so good <laughs> So um, I'm just warning you, if you don't like heat or you don't like spice, um, you're going to try it anyway. <laughs> yeah. I was blown away the first time I tasted this. And, yeah. Oh, I love it. I, I really, I'm not just saying that. This is one of my favorite, let me call it. A, a, yeah. Or whatever. I don't know what category this fits into, but I love it. Well, the government um, calls it a flavored, made us call it a flavored whiskey. Um, and, and so while you're pouring, uh, I'll just kind of talk about the background of this. Um, you know, obviously, Swan influenced a lot of what, what we did here. Um, and then John Cusho um, did as well. You know, to his credit, he walked in the door when we were still there was sawdust on the floor here. And he came in with a jar of, of something and said, do you like spice? Do you like heat? I said, no, I don't. 
he said, okay, we'll try it anyway. I'm like, so wait till you taste it. And I said, wow, what do you call this stuff? And he said, I call it demon seed. So I have to give him credit for coming up with this idea, but I would be really remiss if I didn't give John Stark here the real credit for perfecting this. And he is the master blender. Um, and I'm gonna have you talk about that for a second, but I'll just tell you the kind of the story. So that was how the story originated or the brand originated, but I said to John, you know, at the other John, John Cushot, I said, look, at this point, Demon Seed's not going to fit in our premium whiskey distillery here in Boston, but I never forgot it, and it's really unforgettable. Yeah. Until one day, somebody asked me, why is the horseshoe over our doors this way instead of this way? So I looked it up, and by the way, this catches the luck, and this either holds it in or distributes it. Either way, there's luck, it's all good. But at the bottom of the Wikipedia page was a story about this guy, St. Dunstan and the devil. St. Dunstan was a blacksmith, saw the devil walk into his shop. So um, instead of horseshoeing the devil's horse, he horseshoed the devil, who was very unhappy about it. Uh, I guess you guys probably don't have this label, so I apologize, but oh, we do. that's where this folklore came from. Yeah, oh, nice. it's the same label. Oh, you do, good, okay. I think so. Yeah, we upped our game. So that's where it all came from. And I thought, well, that's remarkable. So we ended up, you know, it's a folklore of the ages. But I also say, you know, the original demon used to be in this building, which was uh, Whitey Bulger. So I'll go back to that. But importantly, uh, John, why don't you tell us how you make this stuff? Sure. Yeah. So what you're tasting now um, is obviously demon seed. So it's a mix of flavors. The predominant flavor being probably scorpion pepper is if you've had it already, um, what you taste foremost. Um, ginger and maple syrup as the, the sweetener and the why it fits in everything is the base is the rye. So I use the rye whiskey to um, macerate um, the scorpion pepper and the ginger into kind of very, very powerful concentrates and blend those in with rye mixed with maple syrup. And then obviously we proof it down to 66.67 um, proof specifically. Um, and you know, the first three digits there are 666. So it's kind of nice. <laughs> really nice, love it. <laughs> nice Steven seed right there. Um, and it's all blended together. And this process took me a very, very long time to perfect um, because each day you really only had one shot to, um, to taste any kind of experiment and balance of flavors that you had. Because after you tried it once, your palate was basically eviscerated for the rest of the day. Um, especially if you, if you accidentally you know, had three X amount of scorpion pepper than we settled on, then you might actually not be able to taste anything the day after either. Um, so it was a very, very persnickety product to get, get to where it is today, but um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Great. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really this roller coaster of spice. So rye grain is spicy. Um, so as as the backdrop, and then the uh, whole scorpion peppers are the hottest non-GMO pepper with over a million Scoville units. So you get that intense heat spice. And then we use fresh ginger. So then you get this sweet spice and the maple, we use real maple syrup. All of our signature sweetener for the whole distillery is um, Ackerman Farm maple syrup from a small family farm <laughs> in Cabot, Vermont. And so the maple syrup comes up and just coats, you know, your mouth and you just get this long lasting flavor after you've been on this roller coaster ride. People, I mean, frankly, they either love it or hate it, but they, they mostly love it. And it does, you know, we use, I use it as a marinade pork, chicken, ribs, awesome. Uh, I've made cocktail sauce with it. This with some ketchup and some oysters or shrimp, awesome. But importantly, it does transform a cocktail very easily. And from a bartender perspective, you know, caliente margaritas are all the rage, you know, they're hot, haha. <laughs> but this is really something very special for whiskey. And then of course, it's a great shooter. Um, and we have, we have just many 
lots of recipes. Um, what do you guys think? Well, my, uh, I'll tell you, my, uh, my wife, after she tasted it, she's sitting next to me. She said, you're going to pour this stuff on everything you eat. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's cheers it's, yeah it's really cool really cool like it really do well it might be a good time to crack open the uh the putnam old-fashioned uh which we made pre-batch for you you don't even have to shake it because if you really want you know try that try them separately but you can transform your old-fashioned a little bit to get a little spicy with it it looks like larry may have a question i see that they got that hand raised symbol yeah. up there uh, the teacher in me wants to raise my hand i oh, guess there you go. <laughs> um something that was said earlier that kind of resonates with me about um the the small batch and as an artist um when we hand make something that special handmade crafted um, object or product is something that is special and that's what i'm really enjoying um, about the whiskeys that we're sampling, but something about the one that was the 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 demon seed that when I was smelling it, the note was very savory at first. Well, it still smells savory, but it was a really pleasant surprise when you took a drink. How you layered multiple flavors after that, and I know that you guys had already talked about that. Um, but I wanted to comment. Thank you for um, having this handcrafted. Um, something that smell or tastes and the experiences feel like an artist, um, very unique, but I really liked this. And I know that we're already talking about recipes. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. The, yeah, and, and you know, you could not have set up my next question more perfectly for Rhonda and John. And before we get to the old fashioned, you know, Rhonda and, and John, as a company and brand owner, Rhonda, and as a distiller and blender, John, I view the two of you guys as artists. There's an artistry to creating a brand and a company, and there's certainly an artistry to creating what we've been drinking tonight. Every artist I know has influences, right? Musicians, painters, writers have been influenced by people in their lives. I, you know, Rhonda, I think it's probably pretty clear that your Boston, at, 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 certainly at some level, your Boston Beer Company experience influenced you. But, I'm, but beyond that, today, when you're walking around, when you're drinking, I'm really interested for the two of you, what are your influences? Like, what do you, what do you look, what do you aspire to? What do you taste? What do you see that makes you that impacts your work every day and, and, and what you're doing. I'll jump on that first, John, while you keep thinking about it. <laughs> well, Unless you're ready. I, I, I am. If okay, you, go go for it. Um, well, Rhonda actually, Rhonda's very, very aware of this. I'd say I have a vast number of influences um, and those being a lot of the, the kind of first wave of the craft distillation, you know, distillery producers and all of their unique expressions. And, you know, I'll talk Rhonda's ear off day after day after day, you know, like, oh my God, I read this person's book or heard, you know, this in interview on a podcast. Oh my God, they're so cool. And her response almost always is like, oh yeah, I know. I know. I was texting with them actually yesterday. I know them. And <laughs> Rhonda, I've, I've actually met a lot of, a lot of my greatest influences which are, you know, the people that um, are, you know, becoming my peers now, thanks to Rhonda, which um, has been amazing. There's a tons of creative, you know, fun stuff to drink out there. And, you know, there are people making it who also have a passion for it. So those are all the people that help. Anyone in particular? And, I, I, you know, I, this is just out of curiosity, like, who do you drink, John, that you, or... Who do you specifically like? Who are a couple, three folks out there, or, or brands or distilleries out there that you're like, wow, I really like what they're doing? People, um, either people or you just mentioned people who you know who are uh, you're becoming their peers, and I'm curious. Probably um, Nicole Austin, who was at Kings County, now at 
Dickel. Um, I think I don't think I've tried a single thing that I haven't liked that she's had an influence on. Um, Rhonda is probably one as well. She had the vision to, you know, of the types of whiskey and our kind of our image and influence that and kind of vision that we have here. Um, and three, yeah, that's two. That's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> For me, it really does stem from Boston beer. And what we were able to do with Sam Adams was prove that Americans can make great beer. Because we used to be the laughing stock, particularly when you know people came back from war and, and they were in Germany and there were just some incredible breweries out there. And we were kind of the, this country was kind of the laughing stock because you know, when we started Sam Adams, uh Michelob, which is you know, it was like 8 million barrels, which was huge. I mean, and that was the best we could do in this country. Um, and I saw what happened with craft beer and its superiority. And I, again, go back to the ingredient story. And so whiskey has always been the world whiskeys. It's scotch was the best. And, you know, J Japanese is the best. And then it's from India, they're making great whiskey. And you know what they are, Taiwan. They're all very good whiskeys, but we should be doing that here in America. And that's why I get out of bed every day is just to make, just to find the cracks that the big guys leave. And we own Boston. This is ours, so there you go. <laughs> but it's a labor of love, and it, you know we keep going. But it has to be in the bottle, and and I, I mentioned this before, but this is really I think the crux of it all. In Boston, you know, is is known for it being a center of education, and that's what we're doing here is educating people, and I get to see their face. And they learn, and, and that education is really powerful. And so we're really, you know, we, we couldn't be more excited about doing what we're doing here. That's great. And can't wait to host you all here at this distillery. Yeah. Great answers, great answers. All right, should we move on to the old fashioned? Sure. Yes. So I, I apologize, <laughs> we should have given you guys a heads up to have, have a cube. And I like to do a little orange swath with it. Um, it's just an orange rind and just freshens it up a little bit. But what's beautiful about this is that you don't even have to shake it. You just pour it in a glass and enjoy it. John, you wanna talk about how you make it? Yeah, of course. So this is another extension of the, of the Putnam brand. Obviously it's bottled old fashioned. Um, it is the, the same Putnam whiskey that you've been trying um, throughout the night, except this is blended with a Demerara syrup and a mix of Angostura um, aromatic and orange bitters. And then it's rested in a barrel once again, you know, until ready, um, which normally takes about, you know, three, four, five months or so. Um, and that's where it kind of transforms itself. When I first started making it, um, we were blending it and then kind of immediately um, trying it. And it was, you know, a good old fashioned. It was interesting. It was nice to drink, but letting those flavors meld inside the barrel is what really takes this um, bottle old fashioned to the next level um, where you're really letting the wood not only influence the whiskey, but the, the simple syrup and the, and the bitters are interacting with it as well. So it's really good. I, I, I got started about five minutes ago, sorry. You know, I mentioned before that our signature sweetener at the distillery is maple syrup um, from Ackerman Farms. What would you guys think? Is that something that you'd be interested in, which would, which would be a, a maple old fashioned? in a bottle or is that, what do you guys think about that? I think that would be great, really good. I mean, this this is really nice, but I really liked the maple flavor in the demon seed and I don't like hot. 
I mean, I, but I liked the demon seed, but it was more so not because of the hot, but because you layered the other flavors on top. Yeah. So the maple and then you add the orange to it would be, I'd buy it. <laughs> it could almost be a, go ahead. I, agree. I, I, I think, I think maple would be, would be excellent um, in there. I think it would be a seasonal thing for me. You know, maybe, maybe something on the springs, something nice to kind of roam through, but I don't, I couldn't see that being a year round thing. Mm. Good point. Coming from the beer business, seasonals were a big idea. Yes. And yeah. so that could be good. Could be good. To me, the only thing that's better than maple syrup is bacon. You know, <laughs> two flavors. Nothing flavored. says love like bacon. Nothing says love like bacon, and maple syrup is right up there. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are two of my favorite. And whiskey, Doug. Well, yeah, whiskey, but I mean, <laughs> you know, there's there's a couple out there of maple infused whiskeys that are just spectacular. And I think, you know, I just, I love it. I love it. I think it's a great, I think it complements whiskey very well. I agree. We did a one-off barrel for a retailer here that had multiple stores and it was a maple barrel. So it was maple barrel finished. It, it was good. Unfortunately, we sold it all to him. <laughs> yeah. We'll make another one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is fun. You know, uh, Putnam is is our flagship. And, uh, you know, uh, as you know, I started this to make whole grain whiskey here in Boston. We have, we do single malt, uh, which is also our pride and joy. And we did not include that today because if this was a rye flight that we decided, um, Matt's talking to somebody. Um, but we also, um, because we can only serve what we make here, we make gin and we make small batch rum, which is 100% molasses. And we make this liqueur line, espresso martini, um, and upmarket to, to Bailey's and Kahlua because they're both on, you know, 100% of bars in America and you need something better than that. So we do that here as a nod to the entrepreneurs that had commerce in the same building. And this is what we love to do. I mean, you know, we, we're clearly our white label rye is something that we're gonna keep consistent as if we can with little variation because that's what craft is, but that's really our flagship and everything else we get a chance to play with. And uh, we'd love to invite you all here to play with us one day um, and Hello at Boston Harbor Distillery uh, comes right to me. And if you're coming to town, just mention Doug Stone and Good Four out. Whiskey Lovers, and uh, we'll put you on the VIP tour. And you can really, really get a, an immersion into what we're, we do here. Either in July. Right. So I have a question, uh, Rhonda. How do you, um, how do we buy it? Do we, do you, you, you distill it to sell, right? <laughs> we do, I, we... and Doug is the guy that's helping us with that. Unfortunately, the state laws of Massachusetts are ridiculous, and uh, we cannot ship even inside the state other than to a licensed retailer or restaurant. So we can't ship direct to consumer, but that's what Doug can do for yeah. us out of New York. Got it. So we, we reach out to Doug, we get it through. Yep. The whiskey lovers, and that's how we can get it. You got it. Right on. I'll be doing that uh, tomorrow morning. Great. <laughs> Why Good. wait for tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Just, you know, <laughs> uh, stay, we'll stay on the Zoom after this, okay? Ben and Wally's had a few drinks. The wallet always is a little looser then, right? <laughs> that's right. Just keep adding to your cart. <laughs> right, exactly. Order it all. Order it all. Anybody else, but before I get to some sort of non whiskey specific questions for these folks, anybody else have any questions or comments? A no, thumbs up, I hope. yeah, Matt, go ahead, Matt. You've got something. I was going to say, uh, the demon seed itself is that actually available on the shelf anywhere? Uh, limited, but yes, okay. <clears throat> Where do you live, Matt? Texas, no. Trying to get into Texas. I have. 
<laughs> because I think, isn't it the perfect place for Damon C? Yep. Yeah, I have uh, meetings with uh, distributors next week in Texas. Sweet. Good to hear. For Demon Seed. Kansas is just north a little bit. Can you make a loop? <laughs> <laughs> Come into Kansas. We'll host. Awesome. But Take Matt, up on that. To do one more little bit of shameless advert or marketing or plug, Matt, we do sell the Demon Seed on our site and we get it to Texas. No problem. So <laughs> Good to know. So let me ask, I want, I usually wrap up these tastings with some sort of getting to know you beyond your whiskey questions. That's, we, I call this the lightning round. So I'm just going to fire off some questions, Rhonda and John, that Rhonda and John, that the, the goal here is to answer them as quickly as possible without thinking. It's like a reflex. And uh, if you don't want to answer it, you just say pass. All right. But it's just getting to know you a little bit better. So kind of what's your favorite word? Whiskey. Whiskey. <laughs> what's, your, what's your least favorite word? Shit. Empty. Rhonda, you kind of jumped to my next question. Um, what's your favorite curse word? Fuck. Did you just say fuck? Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite curse word? Yeah. <laughs> what's your least uh what sound what sound or noise do you love this one ah. erica there you go i second that <laughs> what sound or what sound or noise do you hate my tire blowing out on the highway <laughs> <laughs> must have just happened um prison doors shutting <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Ah, ah, yeah, nails ah, on a chalkboard, ah, something like that. What's that, John? Say again. Nails on a chalkboard. Nails something on like a chalkboard. That. Okay. Um, I asked you a bunch of these already. How will you? This is more than a one-word answer. How will you guys? How do you measure your success? I me I measure it like kind of how happy and jolly I feel. You know, if I feel normally feel pretty happy, I'm doing something right. Okay. And if Rhonda's happy, of course. Ah, took the words out of my mouth. I have to tell you guys, just as an aside, John comes in, he always he just blasts, cranks the music. This guy, Brian, over here has been here before, and Doug's been here. So you see this place. It's not that big, but it's big enough. And he'll blast the music, and he comes in and sings at the top of his lungs, and he makes this beautiful stuff. And when I hear that from him, it makes me happy. That's great. You may have just answered the next question for John, but for both of you, if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing as a career? I don't like to think about that. I couldn't uh, even imagine. Can't even imagine. Okay. <laughs> exactly. well, that says a lot I mean, right I there. was the, the executive <laughs> vice president of Boston Beer Company, which is, you know, at, Eleven right. billion dollar company, but I don't want to do that anymore. All righty, all right, we'll move on to that. <laughs> um, my last question: um, If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at pearly gates? Welcome to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say welcome, but that was good. That was good. <laughs> We've been expecting you. Great. Here's the VIP suite. <laughs> That's, right. That's great. Crazy That's questions, great. Doug. When you know, you, it's sort of... What were you smoking when you thought of <laughs> Great. Well, guys, I hope you all had as much fun as I did. Um, if anybody has any questions or wants to reach out to Rhonda, you can shoot me an email. I don't know, Rhonda, if you, if you want to give your email out or John, and if not, you know, you can shoot me your email and I'll forward it to them. But- it's Hello at bostonharbordistillery.com. There you go, great. And mine's John, <laughs> bostonharbordistillery.com. And, and if you guys ever get up to Boston, I, I encourage you, I have a kid who goes to, to school in Boston and I've been to their place and I'll tell you, I've been to a lot of distilleries. It's one of the coolest distilleries I've ever been to. Where it is, the building, um, the history of the build, the place just reeks. 
truly you walk in there and you're like, wow, this place is off the charts cool. I really recommend stopping by and say hello to these guys. You get you'll get you get a great experience. It really is one of the best distilleries. Oftentimes you go to distilleries and it's kind of in a warehouse or or it's it's kind of like in a in a back alley of a of a of a commercial whatever. And this is you feel like you're in the real deal when you when you go to Boston Harbor Distillery. It's an amazing place. So I would encourage everybody to stop by. So so if everybody's thank cool, you all. thank yeah. you very much. It was a great evening. Thank you all very much. Really enjoyed this. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you all for being a member for Whiskey Lovers. And I appreciate that as well. Thank you all for your business. Spread the word for Doug. Spread the word for all of us. All of us. Thank you. Have a, have a great night, everybody. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Take yep. care. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers.